it's 201 and I'd like to uh, call to order the uh, July meeting of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Uh, before we call the roll, let's have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'll call the roll. Uh, John Anderson, Joseph Camacho, Aisha Cole, present, Guadalupe and Alana, present. Rain Humes. Present. Jason Lindsay. Sally DeWitt. I thought it is, uh, do you see Sally on there, Melissa? I see her name. I don't see, or no, sorry, wrong, wrong one. I don't yeah. see her. Okay, well, we have uh, one, two, three, four, we have a quorum. Uh, so let's get started uh, relative to the approval of the agenda. Are there any comments? I have a comment, John. Go ahead. Thank you very much. You know, I'm disappointed to see that the draft minutes from the April 1st joint meeting were not included in this in last month's agenda last week's agenda, nor were they included in this week's agenda. These draft minutes were forwarded prior to last month's meeting agenda was prepared, so there was no logical reason why they were not included last month. The reminder email was sent out after last week's meeting was canceled, but we're still not seeing those minutes so they can be brought forward for consideration. If I were paranoid, I might suspect that an effort was being made to keep those, these minutes from, being, from seeing the light of day. When staff's minutes from the joint, April 1st joint meeting were presented, I said the CBOC did not accept them. They may have satisfied the needs of the Board of Education, but they did not satisfy the needs of the CBOC. Questions were asked at that meeting, but the minutes, I'm sorry, questions were asked at that meeting, but the minutes did not reflect any of the responses to those questions. Since we no longer had a secretary as CBOC chair, I announced that I would review the recordings and amend the minutes accordingly. The CBOC still has not approved the minutes from the February meeting. If you recall, Anton took that issue with the information that seemed to contradict itself from one table to another. I suggested after last week's cancellation that the former secretary and Mr. Young here engage in a phone call to, evolve, to resolve their issues so a set of minutes could be brought forth for consideration. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more public comments? for items not on the agenda. I'm sorry, that's new item. Any more comments for items not on the agenda? Okay, if not, let's get on to the uh, uh, bond program status reports and Luis has to leave here. Uh, so let's get going. Hey, uh, Ms. Miguel Hooper is going to go ahead and present today the project status updates. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> so we have a, a few things going here. Um, as far as our planning work goes, we have the HEA assessment and the field investigation complete, was completed right before um, about July 4th, and right now the reports are being written with one draft um, school report. And so we're getting, um, the rest of them should be coming in shortly so that we can have a full understanding of our HVAC um, requirements across the district, especially at those schools uh, without air conditioning. Um, and that's part of the facility master plan work. As far as design goes, we have Cam Collins and Cameron, who both are um, pretty 
critical needs projects with similar um, scope and being performed by the same architect. They are both um, in design development. We actually received the 90% design development set um, late last week. So we are reviewing those right now. And, um, and so that project's moving along. Hercules Middle High School, the critical needs science labs, uh, we're in schematic design. We recently had two, um, two meetings with uh, site representatives to go over kind of look and feel questions and try to finalize the building placement on the site um, along with doing investigations for utilities and so on. Um, so we should be finishing up uh, schematic design and moving into design development um, here shortly. Shannon's critical needs project is uh, still in programming. We're still working on, on getting that, that project within budget. Uh, Riverside site improvements. Um, this is an addition to the soils um, project. So as part of the soils project, we're disrupting uh, the kindergarten play area. Uh, and so we're going to work on redesigning um, that to make a more uh, appropriate space than the one that was kind of wedged into the corner um, previously. So that is in um, conceptual design and we'll be bringing forward amendment, hopefully to the board on uh, August 4th uh, to be able to um, get that from the master planning process into uh, the formal uh, architectural design phases. Uh, Korematsu fall protection um, is, is still pending DSA approval. On the procurement front, E-rate um, indoor outdoor um, is going to, is still uh, waiting on federal funding approval until that can get started. Our lake campus replacement, we've been working hard on the contract um, for the design build and hope to have that go to the board on August 4th. Um, Pinole Valley Field Restoration and Bleachers um, was awarded on July 14th. So now we have a contract or, or a contractor almost under contract. Um, so we're getting the bonds and insurance and all of those um, background pieces. Uh, tomorrow is actually the um, pre-construction meeting. So that's very exciting. We're looking forward to that project really getting kicked off. Um, and the testing inspection um, was also awarded on the 14th with kind of the delay in, <laughs> in this meeting a week later, our, our pending awards have now changed to awarded at least for um, Pinole's projects. Mm -hmm. um, for design bill or yeah, the design build category, we have Riverside, um, the soil stabilization is going on. And I was just trying to upload um, some videos to the website so that I could show them to you, um, but they will be up there shortly, um, hopefully before the end of the meeting. Um, so it's really exciting. We are doing the actual soil stabilization component right now. So they are doing the concrete what they have is they have this big auger that goes down and mixes um, concrete into the dirt, the existing dirt. And they start by digging out about five feet of dirt um, that all gets replaced by the concrete. And we end up with about five feet above the hole um, by the end. And these are going in at various depths from 23 to 28 feet. Um, so it's it's quite the operation out there. You can see the big um, concrete um, mixers uh, sitting out in the parking lot um, and the drill rig is um, back behind the building so that it's not visible, but um, it is quite a sight to be seen. Um, so that should last for the next uh, five days or so. It takes them about an hour to, to dig each uh, or to uh, mix each column. And there are about 48 columns. So we're expecting it to be um, about a six day uh, operation. They started last Thursday. Um, as for construction, we also have the E-rate 23 um, that's getting closed out. So the majority of the work's already done. It's now just in the, the, the finishing up stage. 
before we so move on, John, John, can I ask questions on that? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I mean, I didn't want to get to wait till the very end of the thing to ask questions. On the Kar Karamatsu fall protection, this has been going on for well over a year now. I thought that the, the idea was for it to go to DSA, get back out of DSA, uh, so that we could spend the, uh, the summer months and the good weather on, uh, on affecting this project yeah, before yeah, if people returned to school in the middle of August and, and then the bad weather hit us again. Uh, so what is the delay? What, I mean, if it's been in DSA for like a year, what is, what is causing these delays? Well, it's a bit complicated. So um, it was originally hoped to be a change order or what we call a CCD um, to the original application process to DSA for the main campus construction. However, um, DSA decided that that was not, um, that was not going to be allowable. So they made us come in with a different project to be able to do um, this, this fall protection component. Um, and so that, that's really what, what caused the initial delay. And then beyond that, um, they're demanding, it's, it's mostly a pre-engineered structure uh, or system that gets installed. And so um, they're having us um, do structural calculations on the, pre, on the structure itself. Um, which we actually have to go through the supplier for. Um, since we don't necessarily have a contract with the supplier, it's, it's, um, there's not a lot of leverage the district has to get them to move quickly. And this has gone back and forth three or four times with different questions. So they submitted the calculations, it's come back, they've had more questions, it's gone back. And so every time it goes through the cycle, um, it, it just takes time and, and there's things that we don't have a lot of leverage on because um, it's not even somebody who's under contract with the district who is providing the information. So um, I've been told we are very close. Um, <laughs> however, it's always hard because we've been very close a lot of times. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's what's been happening. Okay, considering the need to kind of do this when there aren't students around, and of course, without any rain following us, is it likely that this gonna, is going to happen this year? It's all dependent upon DSA, when DSA stamps out. And I wish I had a better answer. Well, no, at least, at least I'm getting an answer. That. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Helen? Yes. Uh, what are... What are you doing to make it safe? And this is a safety matter for the people that work there that have to go up on the roof. How are they handling that now? The answer to that is we're limiting the amount of people that actually go on the roof. And that's probably why we get the complaints about the weeds on the roof um, on that particular building when we do get the rain. Um, but the ones that go up there, what do they do? Uh, they wear a so harness or what what's yeah they, they have to they have to restrain themselves and so we don't use district employees to do that work we contract that work out with another entity um that can provide those services until such time as we get our railing system installed where our employees can actually go up there safely okay thank you any other questions okay thanks Owen. Well, I still have a couple more slides here. Um, so uh, the community co communication. So um, because we had two um, construction projects starting, we went ahead and sent out um, postcards to the, any neighbor within 300 feet, um, a residential neighbor within 300 feet of both Riverside and Snow, um, with a postcard to let them know that the construction was starting and that if they would like um, to sign up for the newsletter, they could either uh, scan the QR code or we provided the link that you could type in um, to be able to pursue that. Um, we also did a social media post um, on our facilities, Instagram and Facebook um, to be able to let them know that, that, or, um, that construction was starting. Um, and, and again, if anybody wanted to sign up for the newsletter, they could. 
Uh, we also have dedicated project pages for both Riverside and Pinole Setup um, where we are posting uh, newsletters and um, other project information, uh, as well as a nifty video as soon as I figure out how to make the website do that. Um, so those things are happening. Uh, next slide, please. And before we go, Ellen, I just want to, you know, just plug, um, Ellen's been doing a great job with this, getting the social media out there. This has really been an undertaking that she's taken on. She's taking these community newsletters and things that we have up on our website to the next level. And I just think, you know, we should appreciate the work she's doing and just trying to get it out to the community, so. I see we've got a couple yeah. hands. Are we stopping at, at the slides or at the end? I'm just not sure of protocol. I don't know. Hey, this just <laughs> uh, just answer them as we go on because the topic changes as we go on. Yes, Lorraine, and then yes, I'll I, get you done. I just wanted to comment that I live in San Pablo and I was pleasantly surprised to get a postcard about Pinol. So I'm not within 300 feet, but I didn't know if it was because I was on the committee or what it was, but I did get a postcard, so they are getting out. Good. Yeah. I think we were adding the CBO, it, was that because we added the CBOC? I know we, we discussed that, Melissa. Um, I'm not sure if we did in the end. So they went out at different times, um, but we were going to, going forward, um, just add all CVOC members to all of um, the future mailings. Um, and so I'm not sure if others received the postcards or not. Um, and I can check in with a team member um, and that if that hasn't happened, that'll happen after this meeting. <laughs> Yeah, we're massaging the process as we move forward. So um, Riverside went out first, <laughs> Pinole went out second. And so we were like, oh, we should we should try to do this. So um, Don, you also had a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. you know, I brought this up numerous times over the years, but I've yet to see my complaints really addressed. If I had a child, they would be assigned to attend Riverside Elementary, even though the Obama school is significantly closer. As a member of the Riverside community, why have I never seen a postcard like this? And well, I'll grant you, I mean, 300 feet is not very far, especially when one side has got a freeway, another side has got a creek. Uh, there aren't many residences within 300 feet, but just the work itself, I would hope that uh, as somebody in the Riverside community that I would be kept abreast of it. As a, and as a resident that lives just a few blocks from the Obama school, why did I never see any notifications about that school? And Richmond High School is my assigned school, but I never saw anything for the work done at Richmond High either. I don't mean on the CBOC, I mean as, as a resident in this community. I signed up for the newsletters for both the Obama School and for Richmond High several times, but nothing was ever, well, nothing, it may have been sent, but it was never received by me. I'm not sure that our lines of communication are as solid as the district thinks they are. If I were paranoid and thought that everyone was out to get me, that would be a legitimate reason for concern, but I don't believe that. And if, I, if I've routinely been left off the distribution list, how many of my neighbors have also been left off? It might be something that, that, that the district wants to investigate a little bit more for, closely. They got, why are we not getting the word out? Why is it ne not being received by the community? Thank you again. Okay. Next slide. Uh, could I suggest that maybe you could ask the PTA of the different schools if they members have gotten anything and that would help you on the distribution? Well, we did send them to electronically, at least to both the principals and asked if they if they cared to distribute to to distribute to their community or their um, students and, and families as they could. Um, it's. You know, communication is one of those things where, like, no matter how much you communicate, you're never communicating enough, right? Like, you've got to draw the line somewhere. You got to like keep it going, and and it's it's a tough thing to um, be able to to do. Now, maybe 300 feet's not the right number. Maybe we should be doing more. But then there's always the the cost difference of of how much um, you know your you're spending to mail things out. And so do you 
how big do you get? Um, and so, and, and maybe that's something we'll, we'll continue to address as we move forward. And like I said, we're, we're working on the communication front and um, uh, we, we're hoping we're getting better at it, um, but uh, communication is always something you can do more of. <laughs> Um, although, Don, I would encourage you to see if you can sign up for this newsletter because um, I'd love to send it. Um, <laughs> but it is also posted on the websites for those who want to see it. Um, I'm sorry. So the Riverside project I talked a little bit about already, but again, it's to reinforce the, so the soil um, adjacent to Wild Creek. Um, and that's the main part. We're also doing a couple other little pieces, but those won't happen until the end of the project. So today you're just gonna see things um, that were happening way back in late June. So it's moved considerably since then, but you can see before we had a fence line with um, quite a bit of brush. And there's also a uh, lunch shelter, or not lunch shelter, but lunch patio out there that was, um, behind the brush, all of that's been cleared away and demolished along with a lot of concrete to be able to get these um, machinery, pieces of machinery back um, to where they need to be to be able to drill. Um, we had significant tree removal, um, which was good on several fronts. Um, most of them were eucalyptus trees, which are not um, the greatest trees to have on site anyways. Uh, so we had a, a, a significant crane out there to um, be able to aid in the um, removal of the trees. This was the concrete from the lunch patio area that needed to be removed. It wasn't um, compliant with ADA. It didn't have the right cross slopes um, and it was in the way. So it will go back in ADA compliant. Next slide. And this is the actual construction newsletter. Um, and so it just reviews what was completed last month, what's being completed this month, some general project facts and contact information, um, as well as some photos. So that concludes the project update. Yeah. Any questions? Could, could we enlarge the print a little bit on these reports? Could you enlarge the, the size there? I don't have yeah, to see it's, everybody. It's half by 11, so. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean the screen. Can you increase the size of the screen? Um. Okay, yeah. I was having trouble even with my magnifying glass. That's not good. <laughs> Thank you. My apologies, I'll do better about zooming in um, on a couple of details. Um, and as we transition into our financial reports, um, and so there's just a couple of things that I'd really like to draw your attention to this month. Um, the first one that I wanna start with is Happy New Year. Uh, we are fiscal year district. So July 1st, I walked around and wished everybody a Happy New Year. <laughs> I might've had too much coffee that morning. Because <laughs> um, it's kind of like an auditor's joke. It didn't really kill. Thank you for laughing, Lorraine. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Happy New Year. It is July for us. And so Sinja, Miss Cha is um, working incredibly hard um, as we are going through our year end process um, and everything that comes with it. And so one of the reminders that you'll have every year around this time is you'll notice that on our fiscal year reports, it's gonna say preliminary. So we are fiscal year, July 1 to June 30. And so for our fiscal year reports, which this is one of them, this is report two, where we do provide information by fiscal year, you will see the indication that it's preliminary until we officially close the books. And so I did want to really draw that out um, another thing that happened since the last time we met um, that's really important for those of you who may not know is the board did approve the renaming of Crespi Middle School. And so Crespi Middle School is now the Betty Reed Soskin Middle School. And so 
We've made that note here in our footnotes along with the board's approval date. And then we have updated the reports accordingly. So um, where you traditionally saw Crespi, um, you now see BR Soskin Middle School. So if you were looking at the reports, we wanted to make sure that we called that out so that you were able to see that. The next kind of big highlight um, that I'd like to share with you is on page 29. And that is our financial impact um, analysis of report 13. So just a couple of things, um, significant changes that you'll see. Um, there was a settlement um, that was approved by the board. Um, and so you'll see that reflected on the report. And then the projections were updated for the first bond sale of Measure R dollars in the amount of 75 million. And so um, that sale did close, but as these are the June reports, um, you'll see that indicated here, as well as an update for the next anticipated bond sale. Um, and then along those lines, you'll also see um, that the cost of issuance, um, because that is specifically called out in report 13, you see those projections here. And so um, part of what you'll see is you'll see the cost of issuance for the first measure R bond sale. Um, and this is the exact amount, um, Ms. Shaw's precise work you can see down to the two pennies um, and the estimated cost for the future issuance. So I think those are some of the significant updates um, that you would see on the report. So now I'll jump back to the first page of report 13, which is on page 25. Um, so you can see some of those new items now reflected. And so again, you can see the cost of issuance is listed here. Uh, the information has been updated accordingly. Um, but because we know um, that in the audience, um, we have um, people who will double check, um, which is fantastic and follow up with an excellent question. We wanted to anticipate the question and answer it before you asked. And so we have made a footnote here um, in double checking the projected cash balance for June 23rd. Um, the cost of issuance is actually in two places. And so we wanted that specifically called out in report 13 when we agreed about the format of the report. So you do see it here specifically called out but it also exists in our central program budget. And so it's actually reflected in two places. And so um, in double checking the numbers, if you have that question, we just wanted to make that indication here um, so that you would know. Um, and that's kind of the change um, to report 13 uh, since the last we got together. Um, and so lastly, as we, I guess we kind of did the financial reports backwards today, um, I'll jump back to the beginning, which is on page 17. And this is just, again, our consolidated um, budget status reports. Um, and so um, you'll notice that when you see um, this report, it doesn't say preliminary on it. Um, and it does give you the data date. So here is all the um, budget information across the program. Um, and then behind it is the subset for the facilities master plan. And also on this report, um, the naming change has been reflected um, so that you'll have that information as well. You can see here, it's a number two because it's a middle school and we have a little misspelling we will fix. I apologize for that, um, but the name has been updated. Um, and so, and then there is the facilities master plan um, carve out report, um, which starts on page 23. And those are really the highlights this month. And so I, I just really wanted to focus on those. I know there's some really important business of the meeting. So I'm trying to condense my report a little bit since you guys know these reports so well. Um, Ms. Humes, did you have a question? Yes, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, on the consolidated report, I noticed that Fairmont was completed 89.2%, 89 
Um, Michelle Obama, 97.5, and Richmond High School, 92.6. Are they in closeout, those projects? Yeah, so a construction is in closeout, but the financial reconciliation of the project is not yet complete. So the next step, and this is something that we do with all of our projects, is once the financial reconciliation of all the contracts is complete, the project is complete, we will come back to the board with what we call a site budget authorization form, which essentially looks pretty identical to report two. Mm -hmm. And so we will bring that to the board and then we will ask essentially that they return the remaining um, budget balance to the bond fund. Um, and so we'll bring a report that looks like this called the site budget authorization form, ask for the board's approval because it's a change to the project budget. And then with their approval, we would update this. And then you would also see that the footnote would be updated because it would now be closed. And so, yes, all three of those um, will be coming to the board in the future um, once the final reconciliation is complete. Right. So the, con the construction is in closeout also or? Yes. Um, it, so it used to be it used to be reflected in the uh, status report. Is it possible to do that? Because these they may not be mentioned there, but they're still, you know, not completed. It's a good note. Um, we took the notice of completion for both uh, Richmond High critical needs and for the Michelle Obama school to the board on July 14th. And that's also part of our reconciliation and closeout process. But um, we, we can absolutely add that back to our project status report. Yeah, it just gives. And my second question is um, the only um, remark in the uh, proficiency dealt with the time card uh, um, situation. And this is two different proficiency reports where they had the time card they had you had started the process, but it wasn't long enough for them to make any conclusions. Um, we're supposed to be uh, given notice like 60 days after the um, proficiency on what the school board's going to do about it. I understand that you are putting it in place, but could you just give us a, a blurb about the status of it, that it is in place and how you're handling it. So when the next proficiency comes up, hopefully it'll be completed. Absolutely, and I'm really glad that you asked um, because we've incorporated that into our financial reports as well. So essentially starting, um, I believe it's March of 2020, um, we, everyone, anyone charged to the bond program um, has to complete a timesheet. And so you'll notice that in the final uh, financial report, which I didn't highlight, which is our accounts payable checklist, it's a three pager. So the first pager is what I think you could reasonably assume, which is essentially just a list of the warrants, right? Um, but Ms. Cha's excellent work takes it a little bit further. And so what page two gives you is it shows you things that you wouldn't readily see in the warrant, but are still expenditures. And that includes the retention withholds, um, as well as the payroll. And so the payroll's here. What it also shows is it shows you the manual journal of the payroll. Um, and thanks to an excellent recommendation uh, from a CBO seer, we provide that reconciliation in what is now page three of the AP checklist. And so on a monthly basis, you're going to see the reconciliation between the payroll, the adjustment based on the time card, and then what the adjusted amount was. Um, and so this is something that we have done consistently every month since March of 20. And so it's now essentially been implemented for about 15 months. And so you are correct that the performance audit for fiscal year um, 20, did, they said, or excuse me, for 21, they said it wasn't every month of the audit period. Um, and that was noted um, in their report. Um, subsequently, the district had the FICMAT audit, which was the fiscal health. Um, and so when we were working with that auditor, one of the things they asked us for was they pulled a sample 
Um, and as we're continuing to go through the audits that we have in play now, um, same thing, auditors are asking for a sample period and then sample people. And so not only are they looking at the timesheet itself, but they're looking at all of the backup documentation that mm -hmm. supports that monthly reconciliation. So yes, since March of 2020, this is just the way that we do business now, um, which is really fantastic um, and something that you can see in the suite of monthly reports. Thank you. So any other questions? Well, I hope that you all have a very happy uh, fiscal year uh, 22. <laughs> and with that, uh, we'll turn it back over. All right, thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the consent items, the uh, adoption of minutes from uh, May 17th and June 14th, and the uh, CBOC record logs request. Um, so if there are no, no one wants to pull, pull one of these, the uh, items are approved by unanimous consent. Next, we'll go on to the annual report. Lorraine? Yes. Um, our committee is still having trouble meeting. We're in this transition where Don's becoming president and he also has outside jobs and things like that. So uh, what I'm waiting for a couple things, I'm waiting for some photos from Joseph and I'm uh, chapter five probably needs work. I haven't received that yet. Um, otherwise uh, we're in pretty good uh, stand. We have to write the, um, executive summary, but you have to have all the chapter work before you, right. you know, we're writing it partially. Chapter three is done. We'll read, you know, we'll write that part for that. And so, Lorraine, we're going to resume our meetings, you and I, on Monday next week. Sounds fine. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, I have a chairperson report and what it is, is it really, um, I believe that all of you have these documents. It really is the the two items since the last meeting. One of them is the transmittal of the of our res, resolution twenty one uh, one relative to the um, um, changes in the CBOC bylaws, uh, which was transmitted to the board. Uh, and then uh, on at nine o'clock the night before the uh, 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 facilities committee meeting, which was on uh, don't even remember it was two days, I believe, after our our meeting. Mr. Phillips called me up and asked me to participate in the meeting the next day, which I was impossible for me to do because I had another commitment that uh, a meeting I was running for a project. So uh, I draft, he invited me to draft a, a, a memo with our concerns. And in addition to that, I also sent, I had marked up Previously to that, I went through it and marked up the um, uh, their their specific document. And um, my understanding is that there hasn't been any action on this. There wasn't in that meeting. Um, Sally and uh, Lorraine, I believe, were both present. Uh, and then there was another item in that meeting, which we're going to talk about later, <laughs> is that. Uh, Mr. Panis, who is a candidate for a, a slot on the CBOC, I, I believe was interviewed. I see him, I saw him on the call earlier. And um, I don't understand the status of that. He's not approved. Uh, and uh, we actually, I believe he's set to uh, uh, fill the position of the senior citizens uh, group, which is a mandated position. 
Um, so is there any comments, discussion on these two items? Yes. Uh, Don? Thank you very much. Uh, first thing is, at the beginning, you referred to the board policy as bylaws. This is something that staff has been doing, and I've been trying to get them to correct that because it confuses people when you refer to the CBOC bylaws because we have our own bylaws and then the board has a board policy. The board policy is not our by bylaws. And again, it's really easy to get confused if we keep- Well, okay, I really did that. Don, I really did that more of as a, as a sarcasm because I, you know, they really aren't bylaws. But that's what they keep calling. Them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but the, the second item is the letter that you wrote uh, to the to Mr. Phillips or Trustee Phillips and the and the uh, uh, the, the facilities committee, they went over this in great detail at the facilities meeting. The problem was that they did not make it available to the public. And we had no idea what the content was. Uh, they kept flipping it back and forth on the screen. Of course, the, the font was too small for anybody to read, and it was just moving around too frequently. And so we. The problem was they discussed it at great length, but we had nothing which with as a public that we could comment on because we did not even, didn't even know it existed. I believe that this would be a violation of the Brown Act because it wasn't posted 72 hours in advance. Uh, and even though you get some attorneys that will say, as long as you post it on the screen, that, that satisfies the Brown Act, you still have to post it in such a way that people can read it. And we can't do that. Uh, and especially it was it was brought up after the public comment period had, had ended. So again, we couldn't make public comment on there. Just make sure that the those of you that were not there understand uh, how this, this letter was addressed by the facilities committee. Uh, it wasn't a, an open process. It wasn't a public process. And that concerns me. Thank you. Lorraine. Unmute. Sorry about that. Um, I agree with Don. The letter you sent them, it, they didn't have enough time to review it themselves because um, uh, Chairman uh, Phillips would be asking Dr. Wold, well, what's this about? And what's that about? And really, Dr. Wold gave but, some inaccurate answers in it. And we have uh, the transcript of it, I believe. And I think they should review that at their next meeting rather than... Uh, or, or well, ask them to incorporate it in a discussion of the, the BP because it was really not treated well at the meeting. Yeah, well, it was, I got, I got the request to write it at nine o'clock the night before the I meeting. I know, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's just didn't give them enough time to even uh, look at it, you know, and, and digest it really. And the second letter that you, you sent about uh, Mr. Um, I agree. Well, that's with that. a, we're going to discuss that later. Okay, fine. Good. That's all. Anyone else? Okay, let's move on to the next item. Put my agenda back out here. All right, which is. Um, um, Sally, you want to lead this discussion? It's another um, uh, resolution relative to the um, Bond Oversight Committee Board policy, which we discussed uh, after our response to the initial. Uh, right. Yes. I, am I unmuted? I have unmuted okay. my side. Okay, good. Um, so this is a second resolution with a, the, the first resolution. Well, anyway, I'm not gonna go into the, all the whys and the wherefores, but the, the difference is that what we're trying to do is direct attention back to the uh, bond policy, board policy revisions that were originally discussed back in 2019 and then a, a bit into 2020 until 
essentially, I think that the pandemic hit and then everything came to something of a standstill until um, the more recent board policy revisions were presented to the facility committee in June. I think I have that um, correct in terms of the step-by-step. -step. And uh, so the difference between the 2019 board policy and the 20, I'll call it, what did I call it? The 2020 board policy, uh, there were several significant differences. The first one was that the, in 2019, the revisions to the board policies were extensively reviewed by the CBOC and uh, various other stakeholders. And in addition to that, Nixon Peabody, the district's attorney, also uh, reviewed those board policy changes that had been um, proposed by the CBOC. And they had a written review, which was fairly extensive. And it wasn't from a CBOC viewpoint there were some things that they said, no, the CBOC proposal was not a, a good direction to go in, but there were other things that they said, yes, this, that they would be fine. It should go in that direction. And so the, it gave a good basis for a, a positive discussion of board policy changes that were um, appropriate for the time. The, the board's governance committee, which if I remember correctly, let's see, I'm not sure. Tom Panis might have been on the governance committee at that time. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But anyway, the governance committee of the, on the board, uh, the board's governance committee reviewed the CBOC's policy change uh, recommendations um, in November of 2019 and approved them for discussion by the full board. And then uh, district attorneys, I'm sorry, district managers also uh, reviewed and commented on these changes. So there was a fairly thorough review of the CBOC policy change uh, proposals, board policy change proposals. And none of that really has been done with respect to the most recent um, board policy changes. For example, as far as I'm aware or any of us are aware, there's been no legal review of these proposed policy changes. And as we noted in resolution 21-1, Many of these proposed changes fly in the face of the promises made to voters for independent, um, independent oversight and uh, strict citizens oversight. Uh, much of, well, we, I don't have to go over it too much, but you know, the fact that the agenda, the minutes, <laughs> the operation of the CBOC all in the hands of the district uh, and or the board makes independence, uh, th just, there is no independence in that, in that uh, framework. So um, that, that flies in the face of the promises made to the voters, uh, the 11 recommendations made by the grand jury and the uh, original law, uh, the, coming from the education code for an independent citizens bond oversight committee. So it doesn't appear to be legal. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a, a lawyer, but it just without a legal review, it's hard to tell, but it just doesn't seem to, to carry any legal weight. And so this resolution today is one where we're asking that um, <clears throat> any, can, any change to board policy, well, first of all, we would like the uh, attention reverted back to the CBOC proposed revisions 
that had been reviewed by uh, district attorneys and others, uh, district managers, et cetera, and, and board members, and begin uh, negotiations on those with the CVOC. And then in the future, if there are any changes to board policy 7214.2, um, that these board policies be reviewed by the CBOC's legal counsel. And we specify what that legal counsel, uh, how that's qualified. It's one that specializes in education law. It uh, holds a client confidential confidentiality agreement with the CBOC. And then we go into the scope of the legal review. I wanna make one comment on the um, question of the client confidentiality agreement and the, the uh, specialization in education law. For, see, I've been on the CBOC since 2017 and there was um, an attorney, Adam Ferber, who used to sit in on a lot of our meetings and he hasn't sat in on one of our meetings for, I don't know, a couple of years now, if I remember correctly, but he specializes in education law and he holds a client confidentiality agreement with, the w, with our CBOC. So that would be that type of legal counsel. And uh, then the scope of the legal review would include the original law and the education code, um, all the recommendations of the grand jury and promises made to voters in, in ballot measures, uh, relevant ballot measures. And then that any proposed changes to the, the board policy be uh, put forth in, in a time frame that allows um, members of the CBOC and the public to review and comment on these changes, which none of which is, is the case with these current um, board policy uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. So I think, John, what do you think? Did I cover most of that? Yeah, you really, uh, okay. you really hit uh, the background and mm -hmm. the the details of the the uh, the resolution that we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Are there any discussions from the other committee members, or I'm sorry, comments, discussion from the other CBOC committee members? Lorraine. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm muted. Yeah. No, you're okay. um, <laughs> I was reading over it and there I have a couple comments um, that I, I matter of fact, I wrote an amendment to it to change them and I zipped it off to you and Sally in case it passed, you'd have the wording. Um, but on bullet item, let's see, number two, where it says in the future, it states, in the future, before consideration of any changes to the BP 7214.4 um, by either the board committee or the full board, do the following. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that's a little excessive. Any changes go to our lawyer right away. And I don't think uh, that that's what we need because you have at the bottom present any proposed changes to the CBOC, the stakeholders, you know, so we could discuss it with them. But I would say that any revision of the board policy should go for legal uh, evaluation because they made such onerous mistakes in the writing of this one. Um, in their first, uh, I, I sent them a letter in their number one point, they said regular and deferred maintenance projects and all monies generated under other sources shall fall outside the scope of the committee's review. And that's their first point. But if you go to the Ed Code um, 15278, uh, point C says, in furtherance of its purpose, the Citizens Oversight Committee may engage in any of the following activities. And number four under that is receiving and reviewing copies of any deferred maintenance proposals and plans. 
So it's definitely anti what the law says. So I agree with Sally. I think it should go for a legal review. Um, so I, I, and I also think it's the board's responsibility and this is their committee. So I, I would change, I, I like the wording. I'm not making an amendment right now, but I'm thinking of the wording as in the future before consideration of any revisions of board policy 7214.2 by the full board, because they're the ones that it's at their first reading and second reading, they're the ones in ch charge. The board's committee should do the following. So it's telling them that they should prepare before they have the first reading. And this under the next bullet point about giving it for legal counsel, um, I think that, I don't know, it sounds sort of heavy handed. We'll give it to our, to the CBOC legal counsel who has proprietary responsibilities to us. We just want a legal review of it. Now, I wouldn't suggest the, the um, board's legal counsel doing it because of proprietary for the board or our legal counsel. I would have a third party legal counsel that, and, and so I wrote, submit all proposed changes to the, for review by a third party legal counsel, one that specializes in education law and the scope of the legal review would be as follows, which is in it. So I'm just saying, give it to a third party legal review that is an expert in the field rather than saying, well, give it to ours. It sounds too confrontational that way. So they're just my comments and, and I'll make an amendment uh, later if, uh, on changing the wording. Any further discussion, Sal? Uh, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and I was able, you know, I came in to this meeting about 15 minutes, literally walked in the door 15 minutes before the meeting. So I didn't have much of a chance to look at this, what you had proposed. And, mm -hmm. But I did enough. Um, I'm not inclined to agree, honestly. Um, I think we do need our own independent legal counsel to review it. Uh, we cannot have that happen um, unless the board allows it. And I'm saying, do it that way. Um, so that we know that we have, that, that what's being proposed is uh, still something that will support our independence. That we're, we're acting on behalf of the um, public. And I think we need to have that clarity. Mm. That that's what was promised to voters, an independent um, bond oversight committee with strict citizens um, oversight. Mm -hmm. and, and then the, you know, the other parts of the law and so forth. And these are, that's very, very, very important. And I don't see any reason why we can't require that a, a or or at least ask you know we can't require it but we're asking the board mm -hmm. to do this and to do it uh, with a legal counsel that gives us clarity around that and assures the public that yes this is an independent body it's the changes are still in favor of independence and strict citizens oversight, just as promised and just according to the law. I did not think that it's heavy handed. It's just telling the public we're, we're okay with these revisions. There's mm -hmm. nothing that's going to undermine independence and strict oversight. Well, I was just thinking that the idea that it's gotta be our council I don't know why it's, it has to be our. It isn't council. our. It, it isn't our council. It's not a personal council. It's the bond oversight committee's council. Yeah, right. And that's, that's the public's council. Yeah, that's, the public is 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 encapsulated, if you will, in the bond oversight committee. Mm -hmm. It's the public's council. Right. Of course, it's all public agencies, but. 
but this is i don't feel any proprietary you know the, it, it, it this is not a personal we're not taking personal responsibility here this is we're taking responsibility for on behalf of the public yeah anybody else Maisha, you have legal background. What's the difference between having a third party counsel and one of the stakeholders councils? No comment? Okay. Are you asking me a question? Yeah, I was just wondering uh, like I'm trying to make the hey, difference folks. between having a third party council rather than one of the two stakeholders councils looking at it. And I just thought that would be more neutral. Um, yeah, I mean, you, a third party council would be more neutral. Yeah. Because yeah. they have no stake in it. Right. So this is this is a, a CBOC resolution. I mean, it's just it's not a requirement. We're saying to the board, this is what we want. They don't have to do it, but we're saying this is what the way we would like it to proceed. I was just thinking it's less confrontational. Remember the first time we said we demand this. Well, this time you say we reflect, uh, respectfully request it because Mr. Phillips did take exception to that word demand. So I was just thinking, trying to be more neutral. Well, I, 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 would, I, would, I don't see it as heavy handed. I just see it as clear mm -hmm. and on behalf of the public. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be neutral on behalf of the public. It, it should be clear so that the public is very clear. Independence and strict oversight is um, well, those, those not at, know, at issue here. The, that, you know, that scope of the legal review mentions those things. So they would be considered by any council. Well, just, just makes it more clear. Hmm. I, I just don't think it's confrontational. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah. well, I'm not going to keep going on that because yeah. it, it's just a little Well, bit. I think going back, what takes away the confrontational part is that in the very first sentence, the CBOC res respectively requests. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. So I don't see, you know. Now. Uh, I tend to agree. I tend, personally tend to agree with Sally on this this issue. That, uh, hmm. If nothing else, it's that uh, unless there was some way as we get in if they change the wording on this, that um, for uh, you know, <clears throat> maybe it's a compromise between the two of you. Submitted all proposed changes for review by uh, an independent legal counsel, such as the CBOC's counsel. Mm -hmm. The independence is you don't want some, you don't want the board's right. counsel. And effectively in talking to him, you know, he is like a third party counsel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lorraine, I don't think you, you were here when Adam Ferber was attending meetings. Yeah, no. <clears throat> what, the person that I have in mind and um, his integrity is, was very clear. I think any, any attorney in that, you know, with that kind of specialty and so forth and, and somebody who, um, well, it, it's, I think you would probably be more comfortable if you had, if yeah. you knew who Adam Ferber was. 
in a sense, another way to say it's Hollywood would be he is providing independent yes. consul that's, to, that's right. to the CBOC because he is not a, uh, he's not uh, um, West Contra Costa County Unified School District Attorney. Right. Nixon mm -hmm. Peabody is West Contra Costa yes. Unified School District's attorney. Mm -hmm. And and their their review of the 2019 um, proposals was still very informative. Yeah. Um, but it, on behalf of the public, I mean, that's why we sit here. This is why we're spending our time and volunteering our time on behalf of the public. And we need to be pushing as hard as we can. This is this is a light push in my view, <laughs> it's, but it's a push. I mean, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna debate, you know, how much of a push, but yeah, we have to stand our stand up for the public. What about in the first point where her. you said any revisions or any um, any changes? Now that can get expensive. Anything they want to change, they've got to go through the lawyer first. What about revisions? This was a problem with the whole revision. Oh, I see. I didn't understand what your con what your definition of changes versus revisions were. Yeah. So you're talking about this this kind of blanket complete revision versus a minor change. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say that um, any change. I would still stick to this. Actually, any change, at whether it be a complete revision or not should be reviewed by council legal. by council that is independent or is is um you know the cboc's council yes i mean because our count our bond oversight committee changes you know new people come in and so forth and uh, a, a a good attorney will be able to see the changes in perspective and properly inform the bond oversight committee about you know how this fits into the overall picture how these changes fit in even the minor ones so I, I, you know especially if, if you if one were a new member of the bond oversight committee and and the board proposed a change to their board policy with respect to the bond oversight committee how would you know but if you had it reviewed by the bond oversight co committee's legal counsel, then you'd feel more comfortable saying, okay, now I understand that. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I would, I, and, and also, I mean, a, a minor change is gonna be a minor bill. You know, what they've proposed here is going to be fairly major yeah. it, once submitted. But in the future, if they were to tweak their, their board policy here and there, that's just gonna be minor bills. You know, in the greater scheme of things, we're, we're, they're spending 50 to $60 million a year on bond revenue. Mm -hmm. I, I, might, I might be off in that, but you know, five, $6 million a, a, a month. And if it, cost them $300 to review a change a couple of times a year, who cares? Mm -hmm. No big deal. It's worth it. They're spending a lot of money. <laughs> we, need to, we need to be sure that we were, you know, the law calls for independent oversight um, and the ballot measures call for independent and strict oversight. And the grand jury <laughs> said, you need to, to improve this in this particular district by, by uh, you know, with 11 recommendations for improvement. So I, I, don't, I think we're standing on solid ground for saying, you, you guys wanna change what you're doing? Okay, but let's review it and have our attorneys review it. Please, we're saying please, mm -hmm. respectfully request, please. That's all the discussion I have. Anyone else? Any other discussion? All right, so do 
I have a motion. Um, Ryan, this John? Can we public comment? Oh, go ahead. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's been up for an hour now. Sorry, you've covered an, a lot of issues here, and I, I hope I don't skip over any of them. Uh, in the history of the CBOC, there have only been two sets of changes to the board policy. So it's not like something we do every day, okay? And there, just so you know, there is no difference between a change and a revision. A change is a revision. The process is the same. You have to, ha you have to make a, a, a resolution to, a, to change, to revise the board policy. And I say they, we're talking about the, uh, uh, the board has to do this. So there, yeah, there's no, no difference between change and revision. So we, we need to skip over that. I mean, it's a, uh, it's all, they're all revisions, right? One of the big issues that I've seen uh, over this is we have board members and staff members that keep trying to write their own dictionary. It's a one word dictionary too. So they can redefine what everybody else thinks of when they say the word independent. It's scary that they're trying to, to come up with a, a completely different idea about what independence actually means. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to go to the multiple dictionaries that are all available to all of us. I, mean, I think common sense tells you what independence means. And in this particular case, independence means that you don't have the, the body that is over, overseeing the, the other body that is actually doing the work. We're talking about the board and the staff. You don't have the board and the staff deciding how the oversight body can do their oversight. Mm -hmm. It's like when Congress wants to investigate the president. You don't. You can't have the White House setting the terms, saying, "All right, yes, you can investigate us, but you, you can only do this, this, and this." And you're not definitely not allowed to do that. It, it just it defies logic and, and common sense on what we all know what independence means in this case. Uh, it was even said, "Well, it's not spelled out in the Ed Code." Well, it doesn't really have to be spelled out what independence is. I mean, this. Again, it should come down to common sense on this. Uh, you know, I hope that you all had a chance to actually review the transcripts of that facilities meeting that I, I sent to you all. Uh, and the, by the way, I did not transcribe them. I paid a, a professional service to do it. So it was independent. All right. oh, sorry, talking about independence. Uh, I've dealt a lot, a lot with Adam Ferber and there's no question about his independence. As CBOC chair, there's no way in the world that I could have ever told him what to put in one of his opinion letters. Just didn't work like that. Now I cannot say the same about the Nixon Peabody letters. I don't want to badmouth them in such a way that they're going to sue me. Uh, but it just it gave the appearance of what do you want our opinion to be? Okay, here's here's our letter on this. Uh, it was scary to read some of their letters because they were just so full of holes on so many occasions. It just didn't make any sense. I said, and how much are we paying for this? I mean, I saw at least one of the letters that it cost, it had, for that one letter, it had to cost four or five times our yearly expense for Adam Ferber. And it was laughably uh, inept on there. Uh, the reason that Adam Ferber doesn't attend our meetings anymore is because we all agreed. He agreed, we agreed. There was no need for him to attend our meetings because that was costing a fortune. He's billing us for sitting at those meetings. You know, just to sit there. You know, if we had a need for him, we would send him a letter asking for it. We sent him copies of our our agenda packets and the minutes and everything. So he was he was a kept abreast of everything that was going on. But also with that, I sent you actually two sets of transcripts. One was just a plain transcript, and just about a week or so ago, I sent you out an annotated version because uh, after the public comment was completed, Mr. Phillips went over all these things in the the letter that uh, Mr. Anderson wrote and asked staff to respond. And the responses were not, not as accurate as they could have been. Uh, there were things that they were saying happened that didn't happen. I mean, this idea, for instance, that the, the CBOC would call for a, a CBOC meeting at seven o'clock in the morning and staff would have to agree to be there. I mean, that's laughably, uh, well, it just didn't make any sense at all because if you guys, been paying attention, you, I know you have, we would come once a year and look at the calendar and everybody, all the stakeholders, the CBOC and staff would go over the calendar month by month and decide what dates were, were the best for everybody and even what time the meetings were. It was a collaborative effort. 
but Mr. Phillips tried to make it out to, to, to be that, uh, you know, we were going to make demands that were just unreasonable uh, on this, and that's just not the case. But I hope you had a chance to read those annotations because it helped uh, bring some truth and reality uh, to the way the CBOC actually operates. Uh, but also, now let me quote my first comments that I had. Okay, at the most recent meeting of the facilities committee, committee chair Phillips said, and I quote here, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Anderson is the chair of the CBOC. He's the representative of the CBOC. So if there is a meeting or phone call like the one I had last night, it will be with Mr. Anderson because he is the chair. If it's not a full meeting, like everybody's not, everybody's there, he's the chair. So past CBOC people who have opinions, while these opinions are greatly appreciated for anybody, if you're not on the CBOC, please do not think that you're going to be sitting down and hashing out what the policy is, is because you're not. Uh, this one scared me on this. When he made this declaration, what he was saying is that as far as he was concerned and subsequently the facilities committee and the board of education, they would discard the combined 50 plus years of history and experience with the bond program and the CBOC, the persons like myself, Anton Younghair and Tom Pennis bring to the table. I so I hope that you're all as shocked as I am by this declaration. And I further hope that you make these concerns clear to the facilities committee and the board that they need to expand their outreach uh, to, to get the best information that they can. Because they, if, if they exclude everybody that has uh, all these consultants that they hire about educational programs, just because they're not on the board of education or they're not on one of the subcommittees. You know, is that doing our community a best service? I don't think it does. So adding to all that, as you continue with your own plans, I hope that the CBOC doesn't make the same mistake as Trustee Phillips is making by throwing away everything that those that came before you bring to the table. As an example, right now, none of you know anything of, of the discussions being held between myself and Dr. Hurst with regards to forwarding a responsible new board policy and resolution to create a new CBOC, because you're not talking with us. Please include us in your efforts to fix this problem, scaring us in the face. Thank you very much. If there are no further comments, uh, Sally, do you want to move on the resolution 21-2? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, in the most efficient manner um, possible, I would like to move as presented in the agenda, 21-2. Do I have a second? I'll second it. All right, Guadalupe. Okay, so further discussion? Well, I, the only reason, I just think it's a little heavy handed. And I think since we're asking them, they have the final decision whether they're gonna do it or not. I think it would not hurt to tame it down a little bit, but I will vote for it if the rest of the committee wants it. You're trying to get them to do something. You're not insisting they do something. Any other comments from the committee? Well, if there are no amendments, no further discussion. I'll call for a vote. Let me get my list here. Um, Maisha? Aye. Um, Guadalupe? Yes. Lorraine? Uh, hold me off till the end. Hello. <laughs> Sally? Yes. And I vote yes. Lorraine? Yes. All right. 
um, five. Uh, Jason is here. Jason, yes, I, I just got on and I don't know what we're voting on, so I will abstain. All right. So five, four, no against, one abstention, and one absent. That the motion carries. Uh, the next item on the agenda, and I alluded to this further, was uh, a draft letter to uh, the board relative to uh, uh, an opening uh, this, that we have uh, uh, on the committee, and that's relative to the uh, uh, position of an active member in a senior citizens organization. Uh, the letter is in the packet. Uh, really simple and straightforward, and it really is just, uh, you know, uh, uh, my understanding was that at the last meeting, uh, Mr. Panis was uh, uh, on the, was on the agenda. Uh, I believe he was interviewed, but there was no action taken, and that's really. Uh, uh, in our view, or in my view, it's it's in limbo, and we want some clarification as to what what the status of uh, Mr. Panis is. Any discussion? I just have one typo um, that might. I I think it's a typo in the draft. Go ahead. A uh, second sentence. At the last facilities committee, it a. says, yeah, I think you mean A instead of at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's committee meeting, I would say. Yes. Yeah. I should probably, well, uh, that was the last meeting that was in um, June. Yeah. You might put the date in, yeah. Yeah. Right. Any other comments, Lorraine? I I sent out the transcript on this, but the problem I have it says in the um, Ed Code one five two seven eight that the governing board of the school district um, shall establish and appoint members, and it. It did not, uh, Trustee Phillips did not say, well, we're going to discuss this with the board. So it sounds that by them just not bringing it forward, <laughs> it may um, eliminate the candidate. And that's not what the law says. So I would like them to take it to the board and give their objections to the board if, you know, and let the board decide they're doing the appointing. If they decide that the facilities committee can do the interviewing, that's fine, but the final decision should be at the board, not at the committee level. That was my concern. And I like your letter. I think that's fine. Any other comments? Don, your hand is up. Yes, it is. Of course it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> applications to the CBOC are supposed to be routed to the facilities committee for an interview and then a recommendation to the full board for action, okay? The facilities committee is allowed to make a recommendation to the board, but the facilities committee does not have the authority to decide whether an application should be approved or disapproved. Only the full board has that authority. In this case, the facilities committee took no action on the application, so the application should have been routed to the full board for consideration absent a recommendation. I checked before this meeting today and the agenda for Wednesday's board meeting still does not have this application to be presented to the board for consideration. There are still two applications waiting in the queue, Anton Young Harris and my own, that are waiting to be processed, referred to the facilities committee for review and brought before the full board for consideration. One has been in the queue for more than nine months, and the other has been in the queue for more than three months. 
There are some that are saying that Anton, Anton and I are not eligible to be reappointed, but statute does not back this up. In any case, the full board needs to make that determination so their ruling can be used in future adjudication. Adjudication in this case means lawsuits. I some, if someone is passing judgment on these applications and not allowing them to be processed to the full board, this is a serious thing to be considered with and dealt with. I would hope that if the CBOC wants to use their bully pulpit to advocate for CBOC member applications, they might consider these two applications as well. As a reminder, in my own application, there was a lengthy explanation of the rationales, plural, to be considered before passing judgment. Since these applications are not being presented publicly, it's difficult to determine who is responsible for withholding them from the full board. Is this the facilities committee or is this staff? You know, who is keeping the uh, Anton and my applications and before that Tom Panis's? Who is keeping those from even being brought before the facilities committee for their consideration at a public meeting? We don't know that because nobody's talking. But this is something that the CBOC might want to jump into and, and ask these questions and go in, in a public way because it will be brought up in social media, it will be brought up in the newspapers and it will be brought up at public board meetings. Thank you again. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, oh, how, well. how, yes. about, how about just adding a sentence after your paragraph there saying- yep. I, was also, I was also jotting that down. I was gonna yeah. say that is also there are two other applications in the queue that have not been acted upon that, at all. That have, that, that, that have not received any action at all. Yeah. And if, if you notice in the, the revision, which I I'm, hope doesn't go through, they take out uh, any of that. All they do is have their official officer review applications. They don't even say they're going to have an interview or they notify the CBOC or the board that there are people that have applications in. So that is, is not transparent at all. So they're go it seems they're going in that direction. And if you notice in the transcript, Mr. Uh, I don't like to say Mr. Phillips because that's his first name, Trustee Phillips um, said an aside, he started saying, well, uh, when they asked about um, sending it to the board, he said, well, that's, I don't believe that should happen. You know, so he is the head of the committee saying he thinks the committee should be the one to decide. And uh, I think we need clarity on that. Okay, so I'll redraft it with that change, uh, the changes noted and particularly uh, the reference to two, two uh, the two other applicants. And though how long do those, uh, is that from six to nine months? Mm -hmm. uh, John, I do have a comment here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, since you're going to redraft this, uh, um, Don had made a statement which I thought was was pretty clear that we should use our bully pul pulpit to push, and uh, that that this that there was a uh, it's inappropriate or maybe even illegal for the facility committee to make this determination and, and uh, yes. bottleneck this thing and that it has to be d done, the, the choice has to be done at the board level. Now, I think I'm just gonna suggest here that you maybe take, consider what Don said about that as a possibility of you know, rewriting and, and putting that in there that you know, our understanding is that, that, that these determinations are made at the board level, not at the committee level, right. and stuff like that's, that. That's what I was just jotting down here, that the point needs to be made that 
Yeah. It really isn't, as I've said it, whether they're, um, uh, mm -hmm. whether the candidates were rec were uh, recommended or rejected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it really is the <clears throat> the way that the facilities committee is supposed to function is their mm -hmm. screening, mm -hmm. and then they'll mm -hmm. pass pass mm -hmm. the applicant onto the board. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that would help strengthen this. It's I a good would, check and balance, you know, mm -hmm. so that yeah. the committee, who's being the one that's the closest to the being overseen, mm -hmm. well, is not the one who chooses the overseer. Right, and it's just delegated to the committee to do the screening and the interviews. Yeah. Uh, prior to the board making the decision on whether the person is on the committee or not. All right. I will. I will email my comments to you right now, John. Excuse me. Yeah, email them to me, and uh, yeah, I think it needs to be wrapped. Uh, I need to wrap it into one letter. I was thinking of just uh, we need. Well, we need the action on the the slot that is by by not having uh, that person with that senior citizen association. We're out of line with the with the code. Uh, but do you, do you today, want this bond oversight committee to take action on this like a resolution or do you want it as chair send this letter well i think this the, send it as a letter and maybe we'll wrap it into a resolution but i'm just my my concern right now that needs that somebody needs to pay attention to is we're Mm -hmm. We're not we're not in uh, in compliance with the uh, California code. Don has something to say. I, yes, I, I'm sorry for weighing in. I don't I know I don't have the authority, but if if you bring it back as a resolution, that drags us on for at least another month. Yeah, I need to get. That's one reason I wanted to deal with the letter first. Yeah. We'll see where it goes from. You know, if we get the letter to get their interest. Maybe I'll get a call from nine o'clock for at nine o'clock at night from Mr. Phillips. I don't know. Um, but uh, let me just redraft the letter and we'll get the letter out there so it doesn't drag it doesn't drag on. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, I move that we adjourn by unanimous consent with our next meeting be being early in the month and August 9th next month that's the the second Monday in August and again thanks thank you John yep thanks John thank you bye 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 here bye